Uy. <laughs> they don't call me the crocodile man. Open. You think this guy's dangerous? You should see what I've got in me shed. One of the things I do is get venomous snakes out of tight corners, in people's houses, or like here, in someone's car. Snakes in weird places like this can be scared and cranky. And since this is the only time people usually see them, they get the wrong idea about them. But a snake's real character is completely different. Out where they belong, snakes are gentle and beautiful creatures. I'll show you. I'm going to take you on a journey across Australia to see 10 snakes, the 10 most venomous snakes in the world, every one a potential killer. I'm Steve Irwin, and I know a thing or two about snakes. I was raised with them. My father founded the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park near Brisbane. Now I run the park, but today I'm off on an adventure. It's the trip of a lifetime to track down the world's 10 most venomous snakes. Fortunately, they all live here in Australia. Why this country has such lethal snakes, nobody's sure. It could even be an evolutionary accident, but by crikey, it sure makes my life interesting. This trip's gonna be great. I've always wanted a chance to show people what amazing snakes we have in this country. And not in a zoo or in someone's house, but out where the snakes live. In the bush, they're not biting anyone or scaring anyone. They're just living peacefully with all this power stored in their venom. We've still got a long way to go before we find our first venomous snake, but I've got to show you this. quite common to find whoa it's quite common to find snakes sunning themselves or absorbing the heat out of the tarmac here in southeastern Queensland now this isn't one of the venomous snakes we're after this is actually a carpet python now although it doesn't possess any venom it's still got quite oh still got quite a hefty bite now when I try and touch it it's retaliating by trying to bite me I think it's very important that I just shift him off the road because snakes get clobbered all the time. He's a beauty. This python doesn't know how lucky it is to meet a snake lover like myself. A lot of drivers out here will swerve to run over a snake. Back on the road, I'm leaving central Queensland behind and heading north to the Great Dividing Range. And that's just for starters. I've got thousands of miles of hard travelling ahead of me. The first stop's Darwin in the Northern Territory. This tropical city is home to number 10 on my list, the 10th most venomous snake in the world. It's the Western Brown. Right in the city centre, there's very little habitat for snakes. But just out of town in the suburbs, where city meets country, snakes are a part of everyday life. Western Browns have been living in this area for a lot longer than humans. They're not about to move just because someone built a suburb here. I'm told a brown snake has made itself at home under this house. Let's see if it's the one I'm looking for. It's amazing to think, with children playing so close, that we have the chance of finding a western brown snake, 10th most venomous snake in the world. Up here in the hot, tropical north, the sun is very intense. And of course, these buildings create the perfect shaded areas, nice and cool, for a myriad of dangerous animals. Mice and rats often dwell in amongst the rubbish, and of course, your venomous snakes come searching for them, and this tarp is a great place for snakes.
Well, this is the first snake on our list, and I never expected to have such a close encounter. Very important I don't breathe on it or it moves suddenly because this is a Western Brown. Real healthy looking one too. They're quite a volatile, dangerous snake. And in this confined area underneath a house, let alone in close proximity, he's best left alone. Sometimes the best thing to do with a deadly snake in the house is to starve it out. I'll have a look around and then I'll tell the family just how to do that. Here's the culprit. It's not that the western brown would hang around on the off chance of eating a pet bird, but the problem is the parrot is such a messy eater. The seed that the parrot kicks out of its cage attracts mice, and mice are what the snake's here for. Try a different kind of cage, and hey, no mice and no snakes. With me out of the way, the snake comes out to look for breakfast. Mice find their food by sniffing the air. Snakes use scent too, but they don't use their nostrils. They taste the air with their tongue to locate their prey. No feet means no footsteps. Mice can hear very well, but they still won't know about the snake until it's too late. The tongue flicks, tracking the mouse long distance, and the mouse is as good as dead already. Next, snake number nine, the death adder. To find this one, it's back into Queensland. We've got to get out into the real bush. This piece of wilderness is known as Robinson's Gorge. It's made up of forests and steep cliffs. Over millions of years, wind and water have carved the sandstone into caves and overhangs. Perfect for animals such as rock wallabies. Out here, it's a very long way from a hospital. I've got my radio in case I get bitten and I need to call in the flying doctor. I'm also carrying pressure bandages, the best first aid for snake bite. This place is so remote, the rock wallabies haven't learned to be afraid of humans, even me. Creeping around these cliffs takes a fair amount of skill. It's not quite as easy as crawling under houses. Death adders usually live on the most inaccessible ledges. This is the perfect location. Really good. So the next trick now is to search through these platforms of rock, looking for tracks and other obvious signs for death adders. Good thing to do is to look for other reptiles as you go. The sun's pretty hot right now, and there's probably some around here cooling off in the shade. Here we go, this is it. You can see here these are very distinct death adder tracks, pushing the sand down. This is brilliant. Now we're going to have to be a bit careful because we're close. These snakes won't move out of your way. They'll wait until you stand on them. He's come along here, flattened out, down towards this leaf litter. There's one. What a little beauty. I'm going to expose this death adder. I'm in no danger at all. They're a very shy, timid, placid snake, and this is what causes them most of their problems, in that they won't retreat 
and run out of people's way. They'll sit, relying on their camouflage, thinking they're safe. People stand on them, whack, they bite low and hard. This looks dangerous, I know, but the secret is being as slow and smooth as the snake is. Now, this is a potentially dangerous situation we've got here. Nothing worse than the death out of three shoelaces. Have a look at this little beauty. Aren't they glorious? This is the death adder. Very short, stout body. Quite a large, boofy head, triangular shaped head. Now, death adder by name, not by nature. As you can see, the death adder is very placid, very quiet and timid, and very uninclined to bite or strike. Just gotta keep my fingers out of the way. Now the death adder's also got a very good set of fangs. A lot larger than any of the others that we're going to take a look at. He settled down nicely, straight back under his leaf litter. It's important for me to remember that I'm a visitor in his territory and this is his environment so I better get out of here because I've got a heck of a climb before sundown. Cold-blooded animals tend to slow down at night unless they're like the death adder and hunt other cold-blooded animals. In that case, dusk can be the start of the working day. But the death adder doesn't exert itself too much, it's an ambush predator. It uses the end of its tail as a lure. The rest of the snake stays completely still while the tail sticks up and wriggles like a worm. Along comes a skink. Sees the worm, sneaks up on it, deadly injection of venom. It's a huge overdose, a lot more than is needed to kill one skink. But the death adder doesn't strike very often. It won't need another meal for three or four weeks. Goes without eating for months. The giant black tiger is found on Mount Chapel Island, just off the coast of Tasmania. Aboriginals used to call this the moving island because it heaves with six foot long snakes. Of course, the snakes don't realize how much they frighten humans. They're too busy being frightened of us. When I turn up, they hide in their holes. I'm gonna have to root them out. This island is absolutely riddled with burrows. Now here's a relatively fresh one. Just have a little look down in here. Ooh. The holes are actually dug by birds, mutton birds. They were named by local people for the way they taste. Masses of them breed here every summer and their chicks provide enough food for the snakes. The chicks take a couple of months to grow their feathers and fly away. After that, the snakes don't eat for 10 months until the next mutton bird season. Now this is a juvenile, and he's still got these bands, very typical of the tiger snake, which you'll lose as he reaches adulthood. And you can see how nippy he is. <laughs> a little bit naughty. Whoa, now, check this out. Here's the difference. This place crawls with snakes. 
Have a look at this one. This is an adult. Very large. Probably got a mutton bird in his belly there. And he's lo lost all those bands and his solid black colour. And he's a beauty. Now, unlike that smaller one, he'd have no natural predators. And he's very quiet. When I'm handling snakes, I try to be as gentle as possible. I don't grab them behind the head the way that everybody thinks you should. That can hurt the snake and it'll make it want to bite. Snakes have very delicate backbones, easily damaged. I always try to support the body with my hands and make sure a part of it's resting on the ground at all times. I'll just let him go back down this mutton hole. Then I'd better be off. No time to hang around on this trip. As I catch my lift back to the mainland, mutton birds return to the island after several days feeding out at sea. They're bringing back fish for their chicks. When the chicks are big enough, all the birds will fly north, but the burrows won't be left empty. They'll be used as nurseries by female tiger snakes. Unlike most snakes, these ones are born without an egg. The babies come out fully formed. They're completely independent and armed with the world's eighth strongest venom. My number seven is another kind of tiger snake. This one's back on the mainland in Western Australia. It's a swamp dweller. Have a look at this stuff. Primeval ooze. Whoa, doesn't smell real crash hot, but it's absolutely chock-a-block with nutrients. And of course, the insect life that lives in it and on it is prolific. And as far as the snakes are concerned, insects are good for one thing, keeping the frogs fed, fat, and ready for eating. As a general rule, if you use good, solid footsteps, snakes are quick to get out of your way. Now, I've been very stealthy, very tender with my feet, and the reason being, there's a snake in here. They have no ears. They sense vibration. Footsteps pounding away, snake will scatter. So if I get over the top of this snake and shout at it, hey, snake, it won't react. It can't hear me. Here he comes. Be a bit careful. What I need to do is get him over here on the flat ground so we can deal with him. He's starting to move away there. Right. Now, it's very important that I'm very gentle with him because you can see how flattened out he is. When they flatten out like that, that's like a cobra. And he's saying, look how big I am. I'm a venomous snake. Careful. Try and get in and get his tail. Back here, mate. Hey. Keeps covering his tail up nicely. Very hard to get them when they're like that. Oh. You're a grumpy snake. He's a little bit cranky. Now, why? Wow, too close. That was too close. Nearly picked me up on the nose. Getting bitten on the face is really hard because you can't get a pressure bandage on it. This snake is particularly aggressive. The reason being is I've got him cornered. He feels confronted. He thinks I'm going to hurt him, perhaps even eat him. His only, his only form of defence is aggression, to retaliate. And it's very important that I get him by the tail, otherwise I'm not able to manipulate him. And what happens is every time I try, 
Get him by the tail. He swings at me. That's it. Right. I'm getting as tired of him as he is of me. I may have given this western tiger a bit of a fright, but he soon recovers and starts looking for frogs again. To catch frogs, a snake has to do what frogs do, swim a little, and climb a little. Frogs climb using sticky pads on their toes. Snakes have to do without toes. They climb by rippling their belly scales, rather like steps on an escalator. Snakes' ancestors were lizards, burrowing lizards. They lost their limbs in the process of becoming better burrowers. So snakes were originally designed for narrow holes, but in fact, they can go almost anywhere other animals can go. But that doesn't mean they always get what they're after. For snake number six, I'm at the Great Barrier Reef. The beaked sea snake is the most venomous sea snake of them all. Sea snakes need to be highly venomous in order to immobilise their prey quickly. Venom is also a great defence system and so is hiding in the coral, which is where all the snakes must be at the moment. Here's one at last, but it's not a beaked, it's an olive sea snake. Its tail is sensitive to light. It senses potential predators like me by detecting their shadow. seems a bit more friendly. Either that, or it's just admiring its reflection in my goggles. It flicks its tongue to suss out what this strange object might be. But it soon loses interest when it realises I'm not another sea snake. Sea snakes breathe air like other snakes, but one lungful can last several hours. Longer than my scuba tanks can anyway. On my way back to the boat to dump the empties, I've spotted what looks like our target snake. No time to change tanks, I'll just go for it with me snorkel gear. Nah, it's not a beaked. It's a near relative, a Stokes's sea snake. It's a real big one too, especially this close up. snake. Absolutely glorious. They've got some incredible body structure. You can see how their belly scales have come down and divided to make a keel to aid in swimming. Cute head. And they feel just like a snake, not slimy like an eel or a fish. And if we have a look down at the tail, you can see it's very flattened, almost paddle-like and this propels them through the water quite quickly and they can even go in reverse. You can see 
like all sea snakes, they aren't aggressive. They breathe air, just like we do. So bringing her to the surface is no harm. She's quite placid. And take a look at those nostrils. See how she opens and closes them? They're totally watertight. Let's just let her go and see what she does. Well, no big sea snake, but no worries. We saw plenty of others. Time to move on. Number five, and I'm back out to sea again for this one, near Reesby Island off South Australia. I'm after another kind of tiger snake, but even more lethal than the ones we've seen so far. When I set foot on Reesby, I'll be its entire human population. There's plenty of wildlife here though, including lots and lots of deadly snakes. The weather changes on this island are quite rapid. One minute it's sunny, next minute it's cloudy. But I actually think that this cloud cover is going to work for me. Perhaps there'll be a few tigers out. The term cold-blooded can be a bit misleading. What it means is, you don't have your own internal heating system. You're more or less the same temperature as everything around you. If you're cold, you go out in the sun to warm up. If you get too hot, you go to somewhere cool. A cloudy day here is about right for snakes to be out and about without boiling over. Whoa, what a little ripper! Have a look at this one, isn't she gorgeous? Now I can tell this is a female, and she's in really good condition. Now she's also gravid, which is a pregnant state in a snake. You can see, she's got a lump that starts about here and goes all the way up her tummy. And she's gorgeous, very placid. Have a look on her body underneath the scales. Those little jiggers there, they're ticks. They're an external parasite, and they feed on blood in the snake. A lot of Australian animals carry ticks, and they don't present too much of a problem. She's so gorgeous, and Given that she's pregnant, I'll just let her go. When I leave to catch my boat, the snakes are left with just their everyday irritations. The ticks, for instance. Normally, snakes just have to put up with these tiny bloodsuckers, but several times a year, they offload them along with their own skin. First, they loosen the bit around the head. And the rest follows. One totally tick-free snake, for a while at least. Number four, we move from desert island to a completely different environment. But the snake we're after isn't so different from the last. It's yet another kind of tiger snake, the eastern tiger, the deadliest tiger of all. The Reesby Island tiger snake had difficulties getting out of the sun. But here in the forest, the eastern tiger has the opposite problem, a lot of shade. It homes in on openings in the forest canopy where sunlight can get through. These are easiest to find along the edge of streams and rivers. What a great example of how a snake, if unmolested and left alone, is quick to get out of your way, not stand and strike. The rainforest is a great place to see other wildlife too. You just gotta keep your eyes peeled.
One creature you might see is this rainforest dragon. It doesn't bother to run because it feels well camouflaged amongst the leaves. Snakes aren't so confident though. When they sense the vibrations of my footsteps, they take cover. I'll have to check out some of their hiding places. Here's one here. Good. Unreal. That's the most amount of tiger snakes I've ever seen in one place at one time in my life. No one really knows why eastern tiger snakes huddle together like this. Maybe they just like the company. Well, we're down to snake number three. We're leaving the wilderness and heading for Eastern Queensland's sugarcane fields. This is Taipan country. This cane field is littered with rat burrows, just like this one. And given how prevalent the rats are, I would assume there'd be loads of taipans cruising around. But I'd say they're either down inside the rat burrows or somewhere where it's cool. Despite the fact the sun's gone down, it's still stinking hot. So I'll come back a little bit later on. Night isn't necessarily the best time to find taipans, but when it's so hot during the day, it's probably a better bet. It's certainly when the rats are most active. It's gonna be more risky for me though, simply because it's harder to see what's going on around my feet. Taipan. Thing with the taipan is, they're one of the stealthiest snakes in the Australian bush and would be the most dangerous snake that I'm going to be dealing with on this entire journey. Beautiful specimen. They've got a habit of coming straight back up over their own body and whistling past your ear. So let's have a look at him and then I'll just release him on his way. Righto mate. Good hunting. I work with snakes every day, but taipans really rattle me. This gaping mouth must look pretty intimidating to a rat, but that's not the point. The snake's just realigning its jaw. The rat's cover is soon blown wide open.
Snakes have a unique way of eating. They've got no hands to shovel it in, and they don't chew their food, they swallow it whole, however large the meal is. They do this by unhinging their jaw from the rest of their skull. The prey is gulped down head first, then digestive juices finish what the venom started. To see the second most venomous snake in the world, I'm going home to Brisbane, stopping off at the reptile park to say good day to my animals. common brown snake, number two in my top ten, has been seen behind my own house. Welcome into my shed. Every boy's got to have a shed. Now, I grew up in here. This shed's been here since the 1970s. Now, Terry, my wife, tells me somewhere in here there's a common brown snake, and a large one at that. She estimates it to be two metres, six feet. Ideally, what they'll do is they'll stay low. They're a terrestrial snake, not venturing very high, and they're no good at climbing. Now this is the perfect scenario for a brown snake because where you've got rats and mice, of course, that's where you'll find your brown snakes. They come in and around through here, searching, looking for food. Oh, there goes a little mouse now, European house mouse. And there's the little beauty. Snakes quite often find their way up into the car's engine box. Now comes the tough part of trying to get this highly venomous snake out of quite a tight area. The common brown likes places where people are common too. It gets into houses a lot. And when Australians are bitten, it's usually by this snake. I'm quite used to rescuing these snakes from frightened humans. Wow, what an epic common brown. In that kind of environment is certainly very dangerous. I've had to use a catch bag. I don't muck with him. It's tail into a catch bag, and now I'll get him back out into the bush where he can never run into a confrontation with people again. This is one of the greatest rewards for me, being able to release a potentially dangerous animal back out in the wilderness where he belongs. Have to be a little careful, because they normally come out of this bag very cranky. Meet number one. The snake at the top of my list, the most venomous snake on the face of the earth. And for this, I'm heading into the outback, to the back of the outback. From Brisbane, it's a tough three-day drive. Some of the livestock stations out here are the size of small countries. There's a lot of sheep and cattle around, but plenty of wildlife too. For this last encounter, I've brought along my best mate, Wes. 
And we're taking motorbikes because where we're going, even four-wheel drives are up the proverbial creek. If you were gonna get bitten by a venomous snake, you couldn't choose a worse place. We're miles from any kind of medical help. That's why I've brought along Wes as backup. This has got to be one of the most desolate landscapes in the world. There's hardly anything out here except rats, flies and fierce snakes. The most lethal snake on the planet. This is my country and I've grown up out here. And the fierce snake, he's an old mate of mine. But I tell you what, if you take a hit, in a remote area like this, even Wes won't be able to help me. The fierce snake possesses enough toxins that in one bite, he'd be capable of killing over a hundred adult humans. Pretty awesome. I've been handling snakes since I was a kid and I've never been bitten. But that doesn't mean I'm not nervous. You've got to have respect for these deadly snakes and when you're handling them, you can't let your mind wander. Out on the plain, the ground's riddled with deep cracks and rat burrows. The perfect spot for a fear snake to lay her eggs. This clutch is just about to hatch. this early stage, the young look completely harmless. But appearances can be deceptive. Each baby fierce snake already carries enough venom to kill several grown men. Certainly enough to knock us around. snake. It looks pretty drab, brown sort of a snake. They vary in colour. Some of them are quite strikingly beautiful. This is a big one, up around six foot two metres. And what it's doing is it's just searching, probing the rat holes. Underneath the soil is like a subterranean labyrinth. Now, fierce by name, certainly not by nature. As long as you give them plenty of distance, they aren't all that aggressive. Here she comes, she's coming back out.
As long as I'm not threatening to her or create too much vibration, she's not bothered about me. Well, that hasn't happened to me before, or anybody else, anybody alive that is. Just think, the deadliest snake on earth came up and gave me a lick. Good thing she didn't like the taste much. We've just seen the ten most venomous snakes in Australia in the world. Yes! yes. That was a wild adventure for me. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Snakes really are special, and there's a lot more to learn about them yet. But we'll need a little less fear and a lot more respect.